On the ashes of the Assyrian Empire of Mesopotamia, four powers dominate West Asia and the Middle East. In Asia Minor, the Lydian Kingdom had been a small-time power, but the discovery of gold and silver mines had changed everything. Lydia had become the richest of all Middle Eastern kingdoms due to its mines, populous coastal cities, and control over the trade routes. Egypt is a pale shadow of its former glory, but a native pharaoh still reigns there. Mesopotamia is contested between the Neo-Babylonians and the Median Empire. The region of Persis, until now a vassal of the Medians, has rebelled under its young prince, Cyrus. By about 550 BCE, Cyrus had become king of the Medes, as well as of the Persians. Cyrus treats his new subjects the same as the Persians, appointing them to high positions and begins the process of their fusion into one entity. On learning of the Median internal struggles and the rise of Cyrus, Croesus, the king of Lydia, senses an opportunity to extend his domains. A famous story says that he went to the oracle at Delphi and asked what would happen if he attacks Persia. He received the following answer. If you go to war with Persia, a great empire will be destroyed. Naturally, Croesus assumed this meant that he will be victorious. But as all predictions, this one was not at all a certainty. The Lydian Army Croesus' vast wealth allowed him to raise a very powerful army despite his limited indigenous manpower pool. The infantry was mainly professional mercenaries, Greek and Egyptian heavy spearmen, supported by Middle Eastern levy infantry and archers. Notably, he had sent his best heavy infantry, the Greeks, away for the winter at Thimbra, and they were possibly not present in any large numbers. The main strength of the Lydian army, however, lay in its famed heavy cavalry. They were decisive in many battles, and the king was hoping that they would play a vital role in crushing the Persians. The most reliable of Croesus's infantry would have been his Egyptian spearmen, who fought in a phalanx-like formation, their shields and spears presenting a solid front. The rest of the Lydian army was formed by unarmored levy infantrymen and, of course, archers. Croesus's army, by modern estimates, was 105,000 men. He outnumbered Cyrus two to one. Persian Infantry The spearmen with the large rectangular shields were called the Sparabara, or the Shield Bearer. They were the heavy frontline infantry of the Persians and were usually the first to engage in hand-to-hand -hand combat with the enemy. The shield bearers were supported by more mobile, semi-close combat infantry, the Takabara. They were armed with half-moon wicker shields, axes, and swords. The main strength of the Persian infantry, however, lay in the striking power of their archers, effective up to a hundred meters. In open Middle Eastern battlefields, where armored and shielded opponents were rare, this was a strikingly successful method of killing. The Persian Mediterranean bow was a superior type than, say, the Greek one of the time, and would later be copied by the Cretan archers. An extremely successful tactic was the alignment of these archers behind the Sparabara. From behind the protections of the heavy shields, they would bombard the enemy with heavy volleys of black arrows. The elite of the Persian infantry were the Amataka, or Immortals, so called because their number was always maintained at 10,000. Created by Cyrus, they were recruited exclusively from among the Persians and Medes. Immortals generally carried a wicker shield, a spear, bow, and were armored with a scale corslet. Persian Cavalry Originally a nomadic people, the Persians were superb cavalrymen and the Median plains bred the finest battle horses of the ancient world. However, only the rich nobility could afford horses. The general Persian horseman usually had no armor. He was armed with a bow, two javelins which could also be used as spears, and a battle axe or short sword. The cavalry were capable of running down any disorganized infantry formations easily.
After a battle in Cappadocia ended in a stalemate, both armies retired. Soon after, Croesus decided it was time to withdraw for the winter. Marching quickly away, he moved to his capital at Sardis, where he released his Greek and Egyptian mercenaries, telling them to return five months hence, this being standard practice to not have to pay the large number of mercenaries. In those days, war was seasonal and summer campaigns were waged. Cyrus didn't oblige. Breaking the norms of ancient world warfare, Cyrus waited a few days so Croesus had a head start, then quietly followed him across the plains and valleys of central Turkey. Just a few days after arriving at his capital city, Croesus found himself besieged. A day after Cyrus's arrival, Croesus forms up the battle and goes out to meet Cyrus. A victory would crush Cyrus in unknown territory. A defeat would mean disaster, as the battlefield is only a few miles from Croesus's capital, Sardis, and there is nowhere left to regroup or retreat. The two armies collided on the battlefield of Thibra. Persians, 49,000 men. Lydians, 105,000 men. The Lydian army is set in a traditional line with the Egyptian phalanx at its center. The flanks were covered by the heavy cavalry. The Persians form a square-like formation with infantry on its three sides and archers protected behind them. At the back were the horsemen ready to counter-strike the Lydian charge. Cyrus also had an unlikely secret weapon on his sleeve. An officer noted that the Lydian horses can't stand the scent of the camels, and with Cyrus's permission, a newly organized camel corps is established with animals from the baggage train. The Lydian infantry and cavalry attacks but is bogged down by constant archery fire from the towers and the Persian archers inside the box. Seeing the wings charge, a Persian commander in the center, Abratadas, charges with his chariots the opposing Lydian chariots. The Lydian chariots, taken aback by the impetuous charge, are unable to build up momentum timely and routed. Some flee, and others are driven back into their own infantry, where they cause chaos and disorder. Ebratidas presses on the attack into the ranks of the Egyptian phalanx. He initially causes heavy losses with the wheel blades mowing them down, but eventually the long line of spears bring the chariots down, and Ebratidas is killed with his men. Crucially, this attack has kept the Egyptians away from the main fight for a considerable time. On the left side of the field, the Lydian horses are unable to withstand the unfamiliar scent of the camels and are thrown into total confusion. The horsemen dismount to fight but find their long lances ineffective and are cut down by the Persian cavalry. right flank, the immortals hold the Lydian horsemen long enough for them to be charged by Cyrus's cavalry. The Lydian horsemen are now crushed from all sides. Meanwhile, the Egyptian phalanx has resumed its steady advance and engages the center of the Persian line. The 
deep phalanx breaks through the Persian center line and it looks, however, that a rout of the Persian center is likely. The Persians make a stand and the Egyptians are brought to a temporary halt by devastating volleys and arrows from the Persian archers inside the box. Seeing the rout of his wings, Croesus leaves the battle. Cyrus now surrounds the Egyptians from all sides and rains missiles on them. They continue to resist. Impressed by their tenacity, Cyrus offers them to join his service. They accept his offer on the condition that they wouldn't have to fight Croesus. On these conditions, they are spared and become a part of Cyrus's army. Thimbra marks one of the most decisive battles in history. It began the process of the rise of the Persian Empire. The legacy left by Cyrus was an immense one. Unlike the Assyrians who based their empire on terror, Cyrus based his on toleration and federalism. Even the Romans copied some of the best features of his empire.